Okay, now I'm very excited and honored to welcome Dr. Isabel Rodriguez Barraque. Dr. Isabel Rodriguez Barraque is an assistant professor in the Division of HIV ID and Global Medicine at UCSF. She's interested in applying novel epidemiological and statistical methods to understand the dynamics of infectious diseases. Most of her experience is related to vector-borne diseases such as dengue, malaria, and Zika. Dr. Rodriguez Barraquer's talk today is entitled Opportunities and Challenges of Serial Epidemiology for Understanding Pathogen Dynamics. Take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you very much, Bradford, for, for the introduction. And um, I'm very happy to be presenting here today. And uh, yeah, it would have been better to, to be there in person, but, but uh, having the chance virtually uh, is, is very nice. Uh, so yeah, uh, over the last years, there's been quite a bit of discussion on the potential of serology and, and in particular of novel serological tools uh, for surveillance, but also for understanding the dynamics of infectious diseases. Uh, so I'm going to uh, use this time to discuss some of the current challenges in, in this type of approach and opportunities and, uh, and, and, and mostly show some of examples uh, of the type of work that we're doing trying to, to advance this field uh, with, with focus on serial pathogens, including our viruses, malaria, and of course, COVID. Um, so I think... Uh, I mean, I think it's probably pretty clear uh, to everyone in the audience that surveillance that is only based on detection of symptomatic cases may be misleading. This is for, for several reasons. Um, one of the main ones is the high proportion of infections that may be symptomatic of, or mild. So even in perfect surveillance system uh, that reports all of the symptomatic infections, I mean, you're missing a lot. Uh, there's also incomplete understanding of following to symptom disease for many diseases. So it's not as if you can calculate a multiplier and just adjust for that and know how many people did. Uh, there's differences in testing and reporting practices between and even within locations. So comparisons are actually very hard. Uh, and another uh, point that is perhaps a little bit more nuanced is that high immunity in a population might, might mask transmission risk, right? So. Uh, even if you have a very high force of infection in a given setting, if most of the population is already immune, uh, you're going to see few cases because everyone is, is, is already immune. Uh, so surveillance systems based on cases are not enough. And, and in contrast, serology provides a powerful tool to quantify infections and immunity in a population. And, and antibodies, and here I'm, I'm talking mostly about long-lived antibody responses, so generally what we measure are IgG responses, but it doesn't necessarily need to be that, uh, really can measure who has been infected and or vaccinated in the past. Uh, it can measure who is protected if the responses correlate with protection, which is harder to establish, but is possible. Uh, and hence, really population-based serological surveys uh, can allow a question of key transmission parameters and have been considered the gold standard, so you can do a, a cross-sectional survey and um, estimate cumulative incidence, estimate attack rates across different strata, proportion susceptibles, and, and parameterized transmission models. Um, <clears throat> measuring immunity is definitely uh, not a new tool. Uh, Sheldon Dudley, this is a picture from, from some work by Sheldon Dudley from 1922, so 100 years ago, where he me me measured the immunity of school age children. Uh, the chic test, uh, this was in the UK, in the longer boys had been resident to the greater proportion that were immune, and that if there was more immunity, uh, I mean, it, it, it correlated with, with uh, who got infected in the next outbreak. So ex exactly, essentially the same type of thing that we tried to, we're still trying to do 100 years later. Um, and I just want to give one more example of why relying on, on, on case counts might be misleading. And this is work from, from my PhD, so uh, over a decade ago, and, and, we, and we wanted to, to study transmission of dengue in India, uh, in Chennai in particular. We have some good collaborators, and, and back then, no serial surveys of dengue had been conducted in India, essentially. So um, we approached the local health authorities. This was in collaboration with YRG, YRG Care in India, and we, and we approached the local health authorities in Chennai and told them we want to do a dengue serial survey. 
uh, and of course want your support because it's going to be citywide and, and they were very very nice and said like yes of course you can can come and, and do the survey but really dengue is not a problem in Chennai we track cases every year and and, and they printed a paper showing maybe a handful of cases reported uh, each year from a few neighborhoods so they said like yeah you can do your survey but we don't we don't expect you to find anything because there's very little dengue here and when our results came out they they showed 93 percent positivity which is essentially the the highest force of infection that we've estimated in any place uh, or at least uh, up until then right and and, and this is what Kate was published later in the local newspaper after our, our, our uh, paper was published and our results were published and and of course since then they realized they really have having a problem uh, a lot of transmission of, of our viruses uh, so what are what are uh, serious are very useful for I guess the 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 first example that people are more familiar with estimating attack rates during an outbreak and this became very evident during the pandemic here in the figure I'm showing a paper we published of the of the surveys we conducted uh, in a field site in northeastern Uganda uh, nested in, in in some cohorts we have ongoing and here we did uh, four cross sections uh, between 2020 and, and 22 to track what proportion of the study population had been infected. Uh, and uh, here we used an in house developed luminex assay uh, measuring uh, responses to the spike protein. And, and the figure on the top shows just the cases reported, and the figure on the bottom shows like the, 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 the actual response to, to this assay and how the estimated attack rate increased throughout time to the point that by the end, the, the last cross-section that we've analyzed to date, over 91% of the population had already been infected. And this also showed that the attack rate of the first Omicron, Omicron wave alone uh, was greater than than 80% uh, or something like that uh, in population. So, so yeah, so very useful to estimate attack rates uh, in the population. But beyond just estimating attack rates, it's super useful to characterize transmission patterns, right? So this is again the same survey that we conducted in Chennai, where we measured antibodies against dengue, but also against chikungunya. And while in dengue, we got like this very nice age pattern with increasing uh, positivity with age, which is what you expect when a pathogen is in endemic circulation. For chikungunya, we got essentially a flat uh, age, uh, age response consistent with more uh, epidemic uh, or a single outbreak of a disease. And this is because uh, in endemic setting, in, in endemic situations, well, people who have lived for longer, older people have also been exposed for more time, so are likely to be sensitive. Um, also super useful to quantify transmission across sites. So these are cross-sectional surveys of the different parts of the world and, and all of these settings would describe themselves as, as very high transmission settings. But if you look at this data, it is clear that the story is not the same every place. You have places like Chennai, India, or Recife uh, in Northeastern Brazil, with the attack rate, where the attack rates are way higher uh, than other places than like Morelo, Mexico, even though the, the burden of dengue is still substantial. Uh, also super useful to characterize spatial heterogeneity in, in risk susceptibility and this work done uh, by Emily Gurley and collaborators in Bangladesh, like uh, through ICDDRB. And here uh, they actually conducted um, spatially uh, surveys in 70 locations throughout the country randomly selected uh, in 2014 and, and 2016. And uh, at each of these locations, they uh, sampled uh, not many individuals. It was like 40 individuals per each location, uh, but still with very nice spatial representation. Uh, and the nice thing is that they've tested this wonderful sample set against numerous diseases. I think they started with arboviruses, but here I'm showing the data of estimated zero incidence of, of cholera using the same uh, data set. Uh, and it really provides information of on the heterogeneity uh, of transmission uh, throughout the country. Um, but beyond characterizing risk and susceptibility of population, serology has also been quite useful to answer questions about drivers of transmission and to and, and interactions within and between pathogen groups. So 
Here I'm showing uh, data from results from, from cohort studies. This was a cohort study um, in Salvador, Brazil, that was ongoing when the Zika epidemic happened in 2015, 2016. And the nice thing is that this cohort, it was a dengue, well, a multiple disease cohort, but it had been testing people for dengue for many years. So the serostatus against dengue before Zika for all of these individuals was known. So it was like a perfect setting to study the interactions between dengue immunity and Zika. Um, and what this figure shows is that in this paper, we found that people who had higher titers to, to dengue prior to the Zika outbreak were less likely to get infected by Zika uh, during the outbreak, right? Um, there was a positive correlation uh, between dengue titers, short-lived dengue titers and Zika as well. So people who had been recently infected by dengue were more likely to, to uh, be infected by Zika. Uh, and, 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 and our thought is that this is probably mostly uh, because it's capturing more heterogeneity transmission and individual risk of transmission, but this is uh, still an open question why this exists. And <clears throat> Even though that there's a lot that we can learn about pathogen risk and dynamics from antibody data, uh, the truth is that serology is still mostly underutilized and it's mostly a research tool, I think, except for the uh, COVID pandemic when, when to a certain extent it was widely used. Uh, but it really hasn't been integrated into routine su su surveillance uh, with, a, with a few exceptions. Uh, over the past four years, there, ha there has been a lot of excitement and lots of papers written uh, about how we should be using serology more, even some talk uh, uh, about the potential to, to create a global serological observatory. Uh, so really there's, there's a, a, a lot of excitement about integrated serological surveillance. So in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna focus on three specific opportunities and, and, and challenges. Um, I'm going to refer to serological assays, I'm going to refer to study design and sampling, and, and to analytical pipelines. Uh, <clears throat> one of the limiting factors up to now in terms of conducting like integrated serological surveillance is that many existing serological platforms are labor-intensive uh, measure responses to a single antigen at a time and are not high throughput. And of course, with this kind of limitation, it's hard to think about large scale surveillance. However, over the past decade, new platforms have become available that allow measuring responses to multiple antigens at the same time. Uh, bit based assays <laughs> allow measuring responses to dozens of, 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 of antigens and all the way to phage arrays, where you can, like VIRSCAN, for example, where you can measure responses to hundreds of thousands of antigens uh, using really small blood volumes. So this is super exciting. Uh, I, sorry. Um, so, so yeah, this is an example of, of how this type of data can truly uh, uh, give a lot of information. This is an example from work we did in the context of a cohort study in Colombia. It was, a, again, a dengue cohort assembled prior to, to the emergence of chikungunya and Zika. Uh, and, and here on the top panel, I'm using the incidence, the reported incidence of, of these three arboviruses over time. And what we did is uh, after, after the Zika epidemic was, was done, we went back and tested samples obtained at different time points uh, using a Luminex assay developed by Institute Pasteur uh, that contains antigens against uh, 10 arboviruses. Here I'm, I'm showing the data for dengue, chikungunya, and Zika only. Uh, and what you can see here is that prior to chikungunya emergence, uh, most people only had, uh, or, or you could only see like really responses to dengue uh, in the population. Uh, very, yeah, no, no response essentially to Zika and chikungunya. Then uh, after the big epidemic of chikungunya, uh, a lot of the population were converted to chikungunya. And then when Zika emerged, a lot of the population were converted to Zika. And now this was done, as I said before, uh, retrospectively, but you can imagine how powerful this could be potentially if done real time and, and, and potentially it could have detected uh, the start of these outbreaks uh, before the, the, the health system captured them. Um, and beyond conducting pan-pathogen surve surveillance, uh, multiplex serology also allows for much more detailed characterization of antibody responses within pathogens and across pathogens. 
uh, and this is something uh, I and, and my collaborators are very excited uh, about uh, through decade long collaborations with IDRC in Uganda. Uh, we, where, where we've conducted like very detailed longitudinal cohorts uh, where children are enrolled very young or at birth uh, and followed for uh, many years. Um, we are we are starting to use uh, uh, these uh, very detailed longitudinal samples that, that are obtained since birth in some cases every month or every three months. Uh, uh, to to really start characterizing the evolution of of antibody responses to malaria uh, in response to sequential infections, and a very nice thing about this setup is that we not only have plasma samples obtained very frequently, that but actually we have parasite samples uh, that we're genotyping from, from hopefully close to every infection that this that these children develop. So the idea of this project. Uh, is really to 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 uh, observe how antibody responses and immunity, clinical immunity, develop as the response to infection to specific parasites, uh, and this is possible again. So here for for this project, we are uh, using both phage arrays and and microarrays. We were starting uh, with a, a phage array library uh, developed uh, in collaboration between Brian Greenhouse and and the uh, Chan Zuckerberg uh, BioHub. Uh, that contains essentially peptides representing the whole genome of Plasmodium falciparum, and, and this figure just represents the type of data that we're generating. So this is a timeline of the experience of a single child. Uh, when, when circles are red and filled, it means that they have uh, a detected symptomatic malaria infection. Blue is when it's an asymptomatic malaria infection, uh, and the triangle shows uh, all of the serum samples that we have, right? So if we test um, for example, uh, serum samples uh, obtained between two time points where there were no infections, and we compare them to to what happened. Let's say in serum, how samples that that were taken between uh, a captured infection, right? We can start to build models to identify which specific responses. Uh, where, where of these hundreds of thousands of responses that are measured by these assays were elicited uh, by that particular response. But of course, this uh, requires a lot of a statistical, it's a noisy assay, of course, it requires a lot of statistical model, uh, modeling. And of course, we're, th th that's like an active area of development, how to best analyze uh, this type of data. Uh, <clears throat> so serological assays really need to be validated and optimized for specific uses in seropidemiology, and this is one of the greatest challenges. Uh, not all measured antibody responses mean the same thing, uh, and this is just an example going back to the Chennai study that I mentioned earlier. Uh, they sell panbio cells to different dengue kits, the IgG and indirect ELISA and the IgG capture ELISA, both measure IgG, but this is what the results look uh, with the, the same results, same samples with the two assays. So very different stories. You really need to understand how the assays have been optimized and what the sensitivity and the specificity is for your particular use. In this case, the capture ELISA assay, it's uh, a, a different assay and it's been really optimized to capture high titers characteristic of secondary dengue infections. And that's why it shows such a, a low surprise if you, if you just interpret it naively. Uh, and again, kinetics of, of, of assays can be very different. This is comparing uh, total anti-dengue IgG versus IgG3 and, and showing how they have like very, very different kinetics, one being uh, a marker of, of, of recent infection and, and the total IgG of uh, longer lived infections. Uh, and this is something that worried us very much early on during the when during the pandemic when a lot of uh, results started to be published on on surprelance of of SARS-CoV-2, uh, and this is because yeah we 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 were very aware of how much uh, the quality or the applicability of of this of these commercial serological tests uh, might vary. Um, yeah, we were worried because there's large heterogeneity in available serological platforms, and because we know that serological assays are usually optimized using limited numbers of samples from hospitalized patients, so re uh, with, with, with severe disease, right? So recent infection and, and severe disease. 
And, and in reality, if you look at the population as a whole in a cross-sectional survey, which is the gold standard, uh, you can expect a broad spectrum of disease and, and probably mostly asymptomatic cases, right? Infections, uh, but also a distribution of time since infection. Um, so as I, as I optimized uh, based on severe and recent infections are probably not good at the population level. And that's what generally in, in epidemiology is referred to as, as a spectrum bias. Um, so we leveraged a longitudinal cohort that was being assembled at UCSF following uh, confirmed COVID cases. Nice thing is that it involved across the, the, the um, symptom spectrum. So it involved a few asymptomatic individuals, not many, unfortunately, because those are harder to capture, many outpatients, so people with mild disease and, and also hospitalized people and follow them over time uh, for their antibody responses. And, and we measure the antibody responses uh, using several commercial and research um, uh, assays. And, 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 and all of them told exactly the same story that uh, antibody resp responses really varied with severity, right? So you can see in general asymptomatic individuals which match lower responses than hospitalized individuals and, and not hospitalized individuals had like very heterogeneous responses. And, and if we look at the same data, but over time since, since infection, you can also see that the kinetics of these assays vary greatly, right? And, and so you have actually assays where, where the responses seem to continue increasing over time, even though again, they're again also measuring IgG versus other assays that were, where there's like really fast kinetics like this Abbott Architect nucleocapsid assay. Uh, and this was really concerning because this was exactly the assay that was used uh, for most of the large scale serological surveys conducted early in the pandemic, uh, like the Spain uh, uh, survey used the Abbott Architect and, and many others did as well. And, and with this type of kinetics, that was really concerning. Uh, because of course, if you can imagine if, the, if, 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 if uh, responses are declining so fast, you can expect the sensitivity of the assay uh, to decrease as well. And I think Saki Takahashi, uh, who as far as I know presented last week may have shown some of this data, uh, but in general, uh, and, and, and she led uh, a lot of this analysis with, with Jill Hakim. Uh, uh, what we saw is that for assays that uh, like Abbott, you could expect the sensitivity of the assay uh, to decline to below 50% by six months uh, after infection. Uh, to detect uh, non-hospitalized infections uh, and, and, and declines in other platforms as well. Um, and what's disconcerting about this is that if you still, and even though this paper is published and many other papers have shown like a similar story, if you look at the packaging insert of the Abbott Architect uh, IgG test, it still reports a sensitivity of 100%. Uh, but yes, of course, it's a sensitivity of 100% in hospitalized patients with recent infection, right? So, so really before using any assay, you really need to understand how it has been validated and with what population and, and what it was validated for. Um, so yes, technology is not enough. Uh, we really need to validate these assays to, for uses in seroepidemiology and for this type of validation. Uh, really, we need either samples from cohorts with known infection histories, uh, which are rare, but actually there's many cohorts stud uh, studying different diseases uh, around the world. So, so this, this would be invaluable for this type of uh, optimization work, uh, but also uh, samples tested with reference assay, gold standard reference assays were, that exist. Uh, we, since we're working with phage libraries, we're actually uh, using uh, our, again, our long, longitudinal cohorts in Uganda uh, to really start optimizing some of, some of, some of these libraries. So uh, we've tested many of these longitudinal samples from individuals and from individuals uh, showing up with non-malaria fevers. We've tested them using uh, metagenomic sequencing. So here we're generating a bank of people with known viral infections against numerous viruses that show up in this population. So many re respiratory, I mean, these are these are our particular metagenomic uh, sequencing on nasopharyngeal swabs, so mostly respiratory viruses. And then we're using 
paired sera obtained before and after those documented infections um, and looking at them using a Virscan like phage library to understand how responses to different viruses look in this type of, 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 of platform and try to generate some, some uh, real validation data to in the future be able to understand how to use this type of platform more. more. Uh, so I've talked about serological assays. I'm gonna now talk a little bit about study design and sampling. Uh, and this is data uh, uh, on SARS-CoV-2 uh, seroSurveillance efforts. And this is was downloaded in November of 2021. I mean, uh, almost uh, a year and a half ago. And, and the reason why it didn't update it is because really it hasn't changed all, to, all that much. Um, and this is Sero Tracker, which is a very nice portal that tried to keep track of all of the Sero surveys that were conducted at, and published around the world. So in November 2021, they reported 2,620 2, uh, surveys. But if you really uh, filter that to population-based surveys, uh, the number went down to 323. And, and this is supposed to be the cross, the, the, the gold standard that, that is uh, unbiased, right? And if, you, uh, and if you paired it down to 2021, it was 60, right? And 60, most of which, or over half of which had been conducted in three countries, India, UK, and Brazil, and that's it. So, so really <clears throat> 60 surveys <clears throat> in a year conducted in a few countries is not enough to, to, to really know what's happening happening with, with, with a pathogen, right? And, 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 and this was in the middle of the pandemic when, when there was in theory, a lot of interest in serial surveillance. Uh, so, so um, really, uh, yeah, that, that, that's not enough. And, and part of the reason is that traditional sur surveys, uh, population-based, cross-sectional, are they really produce great data, but they are expensive. They require substantial advanced planning and investment. They can only be performed infrequently uh, and often in a few locations. So they do not provide data at spatial and temporal resolutions useful for surveillance and control. Um, and of course, there are missed opportunities. Malaria and HIV indicator surveys could be better used for for this type. But but again, those are are conducted not 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 necessarily in, uh, at the time frequency that you would expect. But in contrast, millions of people are having blood drawn from clinical labs all the time, and most of it is unused and discarded. Um, and this type of surveillance, uh, like based on residual or convenient samples, uh, is not often really considered because it's thought to be not representative of the population. Uh, but our thought early in the pandemic was, and, or, and still is, that maybe if we select these samples appropriately, uh, it is possible to approximate a representative sample of the population. And, and, and we also thought that this could be possible uh, with the rich individual data contained in health system electronic medical records. Uh, yeah, that, that, that if you use that information to select samples, you could get, approximate the population. So um, in, in early in the, in the pandemic, we launched a problem to do uh, a, a project to do uh, surveillance in San Francisco uh, using the UCSF and San Francisco Department of Public Health health network uh, residual samples. Uh, we thought this would be super easy, just select the sample using, using uh, electronic medical records pick them up from the labs, test them and, and done, and, and it would be super fast. Of course, at the end of the day, the project was uh, much, much harder than we thought, uh, like the extraction of the EMR data, the coordination of the pickups, yeah, biobanking, everything was was a lot of work. And, 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 and the biggest challenge was that we couldn't secure funding to continue this. So we were only able to really conduct it over the first year uh, of the pandemic. Um, but still, it was a, 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 an interesting experience, and I think it has potential uh, if, if, if done systematically. Uh, so yes, as I said, we use the networks of, of UCSF and, and the SFDPH hospital networks, where they collect over 50,000 blood uh, samples every single month. We use rich metadata uh, to select samples exclusively from, from patients residing in San Francisco, including homeless pets. Uh, participants. We excluded individuals who were tested um, for COVID during the visit when they received their blood draw, uh, unless this was a visit for routine purposes. 
uh, testing for routine purposes. Um, in adults, we restricted to outpatient and emergency department visits. Uh, in children, we couldn't restrict to outpatient visits because children are bled more infrequently. So we had to include both inpatients, which is a limitation, and, and we weighted the samples by age group and, and zip code. Uh, and these two figures just give a, a sense of the representativeness. Um, this is Epi Week of Sample Collection, and, and it shows the distribution of ages uh, that, that we were able to get. Uh, and this, again, shows the proportion of the population that lives in a given zip code in San Francisco and the proportion of the samples. Uh, so, yeah, we, we were able to, to get a representative sample uh, or somewhat representative sample of the city. Uh, and this shows the results over the first few months of the pandemic. This was by June uh, of 2020. We estimated very low attack rates in the city, 4.4% altogether. But as this map shows, we were already able to, to detect huge heterogeneity with some of the uh, poorest neighborhoods having experienced attack rates as high as 10% by then. Uh, and similarly, lots of heterogeneities by, by race, ethnicity with higher attack rates back by then in, in, in Hispanic populations. Um, and uh, we, we went back and did some additional sampling in uh, the early months of, of, of 2021 when vaccination had just started. Uh, and this time we actually measured responses to two antigens. Uh, because we wanted to be able to differentiate vaccination versus natural infection. So we, we used a nucleocapsid based uh, antigen with, with measures response to infection and a spike based antigen that measures responses to both infection and vaccination. Uh, and, and this map shows the probability, the model probability of prior infection versus the probability of vaccination. And what's, what was super striking is that this suggested that early during vaccination and uh, really the areas that had the highest attack rates by then of infection were the same areas that had the lowest probabilities of, of vaccination, uh, um, which I guess was not entirely unexpected, but it's still super striking to see. Unfortunately, these disparities uh, were resolved fast, soon fast uh, after, I mean, the, the health department really focused on expanding coverage uh, of vaccination, and, and this was later resolved, but this was uh, is striking to see for sure. Um, so the other question is whether a similar approach can work uh, in other settings. Uh, can maybe where there's less uh, detailed uh, EMR data to 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 really select the samples, uh, and that's something we are in the process of of starting right uh, now. Like we we have. Um, malaria surveillance sites uh, throughout Uganda. Um, over 70 malaria surveillance sites throughout Uganda. But the nice thing is that as part of, of some of these uh, surveillance studies, we're also conducting cross-sectional surveys in the immediate target areas of all of these health facilities. Uh, so this is a perfect setting to compare uh, the type of estimates that, that you can get from health facility surveillance to the cross-sectional service surveys. Uh, and we're working on that because we still do think that, that this type of sampling could provide uh, much better data than, than cross-sectional surveys uh, will, will, well, better in the sense of more spatially and temporally resolved than, than what we can get do with, with uh, cross-sectional surveillance. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so now I want to discuss briefly um, some of the challenges in analytical pipelines. Um, and I think a, a question that is uh, still open is really how to translate serological data into meaningful epidemiologic inference. Uh, and, and this is well established for, and there's very uh, well established methods for uh, pathogens uh, that have low antigenic diversity and, and elicit long lasting immunity. Uh, so this is like the uh, ideal antibody kinetics that, that you could expect uh, where a person is completely uh, naive, has no response, then gets infected, on a beautiful response that wins a little bit, but high antibody titers can be detected for years, right? And when you have like this type of beautiful response, if you measure titers of 
to let's say IgG antibodies, many times you get like, or sometimes you get a very nice bimodal distribution. So it, of course, becomes super easy to establish a cutpoint if you have gold standard samples, and you know these are with quite a good good certainty. These are my zero positive people. These are my zero negative people, and then you can do age stratified zero prevalence and, and and estimate forces of infection with catalytic models, and and this is wonderful. But the truth is that the the story is much more complicated uh, uh, for for antigenically diverse pathogens and most antibody responses don't look like this. So this was actually an example for chikungunya that is one of the best behaved pathogens and assays that, that I know of. Uh, but for example, if you look at dengue or at Zika, this is what the distributions uh, in the, uh, when you do a cross-sectional survey and plot the distribution of MFIs, let's say this is using the Luminex assay I mentioned before, look like. So it's, it's not really possible to establish a, uh, a nice cut cutoff and any cutoff that you establish will come at a trade off between uh, sensitivity uh, and specificity. Uh, so, so really, if we're going to use this type of data uh, to, and we want to estimate, uh, let's say, uh, forces of infection, strain specific forces of infection, uh, you really re require to understand uh, the, the um, uh, antibody kinetics, right? Or you would benefit to understanding antibody kinetics and jointly modeling um, the observation process and, and, the, and the kinetics. So here it's just an example of that. Let's assume you have three uh, pathogens that, or strains within pathogens that somewhat cross-react between each other. So when you get infected by one, uh, the responses to others get boosted. This is what the data uh, looks like, and if you really, really want to start uh, estimating the force of infection for each of them, you really need to understand like these kinetics, these cross-reactivity patterns, and, and potentially do some joint modeling. And there's been some wonderful work uh, done uh, in this space recently. James Hay for flu has done some wonderful work. Uh, Henrik Salje for dengue has done some wonderful work. Uh, but but there's a lot of room, and, and this is an area in which we're very interested, particularly if we are thinking about uh, these highly multiplexed assays uh, where you're looking at responses and many times cross-reactive responses across many pathogen groups. And I'm just going to end uh, with this example uh, of some work uh, that is being led by a postdoc in, in my group, Marco Hamins Portolas, uh, where he's really revisiting um, dengue data, like in this case, uh, these are dengue responses to the four serotypes using hemagglutination inhibition assays. Uh, and he's really trying to go uh, beyond the single code of uh, idea and using uh, machine learning methods uh, to really uh, look at what infections look like in serological data. This is longitudinal serological data, so it's in some ways there's more, much more information than in cross-sectional data but he's using um, longitudinal data to really get at uh, who was infected, right? And who was not necessarily infected the first time, but also boosted, uh, infected a second time or, or, or a third time, right? Uh, and uh, yeah, what, what he's seeing is that uh, using machine learning methods, uh, of course, validated against gold, some sort of gold standard data, he's, he's able to recover 20 to 30% more infections than using naive cutoffs of who's infected and 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 who is not, um, but yeah, uh, I I want to end there so that there's time for potentially some questions. Uh, sorry for the low resolution of of this of this uh, figure. I don't know when it got downgraded like that, uh, but uh, yeah, I, the thought is that. Um, um, while serological and multiplex serology is super, super uh, promising, uh, if we really, really want to think of it uh, of, of, of integrated serological sur surveillance and integrated multiplex serological surveillance, we really need to work uh, in three areas, validation and optimization of assays, uh, development of analytical pipelines and, and, and of course, think of, of uh, creative design so that we can obtain the samples and the data at the spatial and temporal resolution that is most useful. So final thoughts. 
uh, sir epidemiology is probably an underutilized tool with great potential for for epidemiology pathogen dynamics and potential in public health uh, it's not it, it's not meant to replace uh, case-based surveillance i think it's just another tool nicely complementary to case reports and of course to genomic surveillance as well and and the dream is to be able to integrate the different data sources uh, i think there's many missed opportunities with existing studies and simple repo sample repositories that exist uh, but yes, in, in general, I think that system, systematic, continuous, and multiplex surveillance would allow uh, a, a much more careful monitoring of transmission and immunity of populations, would allow early detection of emerging pathogens, uh, evaluation of, of and targeting of, of interventions, and, and, and of course, answering fundamental questions on the transmission dynamics of pathogens. Um, should we be moving towards a global immune observatory? I think it's still an open question, but I think uh, there's a lot more that we should and could be doing uh, with serology and, and hopefully with the excitement and the attention brought to serology after the pandemic, uh, the field will advance uh, Yeah, in, in, in the coming years. So thank you. Um, yeah, I, I want to acknowledge a very big group of, of, of collaborators that has been involved in different parts of this work. Uh, yeah, and open open to questions. Awesome, thank you very much, Isabel. That was a um, really fascinating talk, and I definitely appreciate your emphasizing the uh, the opportunity we have to look at something that's so complex and so important uh, with more detail with future uh, serological surveys. Um, so we'll now take questions. Uh, as a reminder to everyone, uh, feel free to um, send me messages. I see that there's always a raised hand. You can also just raise your hand. That might be easier too. Um, but if, if you'd like, uh, send questions to me directly and I can read them out. Um, otherwise, you can raise your hand or um, just let me know. Anyways, uh, so I see we have a question from Maddie Klein. Uh, Maddie, would you like to uh, unmute yourself and your camera? Surprise. The oh. <laughs> line is actually Mark. Um, I don't know how to go on uh, on video, but um, uh, thank you, Isabel, for a great talk. Um, uh, I have two questions. One is uh, a technical one about the, um, there was a study that came out of the Moderna trial of the vaccine that showed that um, only something like 40% of PCR positive people uh, who who had a documented infection and had been vaccinated seroconverted to N, whereas 90 something percent of those who were seronegative, who 90, 40% of those who had been vaccinated seroconverted to N when they were PCR positive, yeah. And uh, whereas if you were unvaccinated, definitely con converted to N. So uh, my question is, is this, do you know of other vaccines where this has been looked at or other even other examples of COVID vaccines? And are there any good solutions to this problem that you don't get a signal for a lot of people after they're vaccinated, if it's real? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think, I mean, uh, yeah, I haven't I, ha I haven't looked at the results of this particular study that you mentioned. I'd, I'd love to see them, but I think I think there's a challenge there, which is I mean, what, it depends. Yeah, a, a technology solution, right? Like I mean, what assay has been used uh, and what other assays can be? Because yeah, the pro part part of the issue is the huge heterogeneity that exists with, with, within uh, between assays, right? So some assays may capture responses that some others do not, right? Uh, and again, going back, and, and of course, this is this is this is the, the, probably the study had like those samples, right? But I, I do think that um, having the gold standard samples to be able to quantify that uh, that kind of imperfect specificity and sensitive and or sensitivity in this case is the key, right? I mean, I think that the problem is not so much having imperfect sensitivity. The problem is not knowing that you <laughs> that you have imperfect sensitivity, right? And of course, it also opens many questions in terms of the immune response. Uh, but from the seropoemiology uh, uh, perspective, the, the 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 threat is not understanding what the limitations of your assay are, right? Like if you truly understand what your assay is telling you, you can statistically, in some ways, correct for it, right? Uh, if you have no idea, then then you're yeah, you're just gonna make wrong conclusions. And if if I could follow up with with the part you showed about the. Um, different sensitivity over time. 
um, as as you get further away from infection in in non hospitalized people, can that how much can that be solved by changing the cutoff, and how much is it a hardwired problem that there is no cutoff? Or that yeah, so so it can it can definitely uh, be solved to a, a a a great extent changing the cutoff. Uh, so for this out architect assay, uh, this was the solution proposed by. Uh, so one of the one of the studies that used it was the Manaus study um, by Nuno Faria and, and and collaborators, and, and that's exactly what they did at the end of the day was they had some different approaches to estimate. They, they realized the weighting was a huge, huge problem, and and with the available data they had, they really calibrated, recalibrated the assay uh, to to. Uh, decrease the cutoff, right? But I think, I mean, I think just recalibrating the cutoff is not necessarily the best solution. Um, decrease? Yeah. I don't know. Hopefully this is inter intermittent, oh no. everybody lost it i yeah but i still see isabel's uh screen which i think we all see uh or at least a window for her um i guess we will sit tight for a second while we try and get isabel back <clears throat> I'm just exchanging messages with the admins to try and uh, hopefully get Isabel back. So sorry about this. Um, second. Yeah, I don't know, Brad. I just emailed her to say what's happening on your end, but gotcha. Back any insight? Not any. Not sure how to troubleshoot. I mean, right. Well, yeah. We'll um, make sure that we, yeah. That's great. Send an email. And then, um, I mean, we have until the end of the hour, so um, I'll certainly be here. Uh, and I have some more questions myself, so hopefully we can get to that. Um, but yeah, for now, we'll just just wait a bit. She's back. Awesome. Perfect. All right, we have you back, Isabel. And uh, you sorry, were currently sorry, muted. Yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry about this connectivity well. in the Bay Area is not as, as good as it should be. <laughs> yeah, it's not like there's a million, you know, startups and big tech there. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so yeah, I don't know, Marks. Wh wh where, where, where you lost me in responding to to Mark, uh, but I, but yeah, my, but my answer, my uh, yeah, the summary of my answer is that you can decrease the cut point, but it only solves the pro the, the problem uh, marginally because oftentimes you reach the lower dynamic range of the assay, and that's all you can do. So assays do probably need to be reoptimized for some, at least some assays need to be reoptimized to be truly useful in therapy epidemiology. Particularly, we are detecting like lower lower antibody responses. Uh, yeah. Thanks. 
Well, the, yeah, I actually had kind of a question, maybe somewhat related. Um, going back to the San Francisco um, zero surveillance um, results you were showing, I was kind of struck by what I what I naively think as uh, somewhat low vaccination rates uh, in an area that I thought ultimately had a very high vaccination rates. So I was wondering if that was more of a function of when you were looking. Yeah, it was, yeah, this was yeah. early 2021. So it was early in vaccination. It yeah. Was, do you have any context for, um, because we're here in Massachusetts and, uh, you know, every state was kind of figuring things out themselves and or um, doing things differently in terms of vaccine rollouts. Um, did you have, do you have any context for the timing of uh, how vaccines were uh, administered in San Francisco and to whom uh, and sort of those details uh it was largely it was it was it was quite fast the rollout uh, i mean it started as uh everywhere else focused on on health uh personnel in december and 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 like particularly the 2020 uh which was a matter of a lot of controversy i i mean i'm, I'm I, it wouldn't surprise me if if in at harvard it was the same thing like uh, I got access to the vaccine super early, even though uh, for many reasons I shouldn't have, uh, right? I mean, I'm health, but not really. Uh, <laughs> but soon after that, it just became uh, like age. I, I, it was a very nice age-based targeting and, and uh, uh, yeah, including also high-risk groups, but mostly, mostly predominantly age-based. Uh, and it, uh, initially part of the issue was reaching populations that, that we're just not accessing the vaccine, but then mm -hmm. um, the DPH really made an effort to to get to those populations, and it was a good uptake and 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 relatively fast uptake as compared to the rest of the country. It's a matter of when we sampled, right? Right. But gotcha. we were interested in looking. But we we're interested in looking like at the early uptake per se, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And did you have a certain age bias with your cohort that um, that would maybe also exacerbate any of those those no, differences? No, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't think that's that, yeah. that, that's the issue. Yeah. I, yeah. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah. Um, let's see, uh, we have some time for further questions. Um, I have another one, but I'm not, this might be some sort of classic result that I'm unfamiliar with. Uh, you're talking about, uh, you had some really cool longitudinal, uh, zero sur surveillance, uh, with malaria that you showed. Um, and I was kind of just curious about whether or not there were comparison that you guys did comparisons looking at. Uh, the types of like the the granular detail of the response between repeat infections and whether or not you know what level of uh, immune imprinting there might be. Um, I'm not sure if this is kind of well known. I'm naive to this personally, uh, so I just wondered so, if I mean, you looked at that. Uh, I mean, this is work very much in progress, right? Like mm -hmm. we are literally, uh, but those are all the questions that we're we're interested in, right? Like so, sure. uh, but but the the the, the double the, the double challenge here is. That we are trying to understand the disease and the assay simultaneously, right? Mm. Like so, we have to be super careful, right? Because this technology, like, yeah. So that's why we are also pairing it with other better characterized technologies that maybe show information to a lower number of antigens. But I, yeah. I mean that we understand better. But that's exactly the questions that we that we are interested in is like how the antibody response evolves as a function of repeated infection mm, uh, yeah. with the nice thing that we actually have the sequences of the infecting parasites, right? So mm -hmm. very, try, try to tease out if, if we can capture variant specific responses or right. or not and, and figure out which which antigens are uh, generating responses and, and whatnot, yeah. Mm -hmm. And did you have an opportunity to look at the timing of maybe um, later asymptomatic uh, infections relative to the timing of prior yeah, symptomatic exactly, responses. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Like we, I mean, it, it's mm -hmm. such a dense sample set that that mm -hmm. we can we can start looking at, 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 at all of those questions, right? And and how time matters and how uh, infection sequence matters. Uh, uh, yeah. So we'll see. I mean, uh, cool. but it's I'll look forward to many it. challenges, oh. question, <laughs> challenging questions with lots of of, of yeah. yeah. Very complicated for sure, and um, like you like you were alluding to, a lot a lot more. We could be all doing more uh, in terms of measuring measuring these sort of things. Um, okay, we okay, are we at are. the end of the hour, so I'm going to close this out. Uh, you know, on behalf of the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics and Harvard Th Chan School of Public Health, uh, let's thank Dr. Rodriguez Barake again for uh, joining us and a really great talk and a really good discussion. So thank you. 
Um, please do get in touch with us um, if you have any questions, further questions for our speaker, and uh, check out the CCDD website to stay up to date for the upcoming seminars. Next week, we'll be uh, in the hybrid um, setting again, where we'll be in person and also on Zoom. Uh, so we hope to see you then. Uh, for now, thank you again for joining us. Bye-bye, um, everybody.